Hey you, Bravo's now in Canada. I just got chills. If you know Bravo. I love that. I love love that. that. You love that. You know. Vanderpump Rules. Why does it have to get so complicated? Summer House. Don't activate me because you've not seen me activate it. Below Deck. I'm not your friend. I'm your captain. Top Chef. Hi, Chef. And Housewives. <gasps> Definitely Housewives. I'm not going to lie. I'm looking forward to this. Bravo. Now available. This is safe. Subscribe now with your TV service provider. Fall in Canada has never been hotter. Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter. Podcasts that resonate. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a pretty big election going on down south right now. And if you look at who's voting for whom, you will notice one thing. Women, overwhelmingly voting for Kamala Harris. Men, not quite as overwhelmingly, but still solidly voting for Donald Trump. In fact, new research finds that women, especially, are more liberal than they have ever been in their voting intentions. And it's with that in mind, and with an eye to the presidential ticket in the United States, we wanted to share this episode with you that explores just exactly what's happening with the political gender gap. Have a listen. Men are this way, and women are that way. Entire careers in industries ranging from self-help to advertising to stand-up comedy have been based on this premise. And superficially, it can be true. We do like different things sometimes. But generally, when it comes to political ideology, how we see the world around us, it traditionally hasn't been. Until now. This is a very recent phenomenon, but it is a pronounced one. And it's accelerating. The percentage of young men and young women who describe themselves as conservative and liberal is splitting wide apart. In many countries around the world, including here in Canada, we don't know exactly why this is happening, but we have some good ideas. And we don't know fully what the implications are but most of them seem pretty bad. Are we really headed for a world where politics pits men and women against one another? What kind of a world would that be? What happens if we go down that path? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. John Byrne Murdoch is the columnist and the chief data reporter with the Financial Times. Hey, John. Hello, thanks for having me. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you for uh, finding time for us. Now, I wanted to just quickly start with a little bit of historical context to this, because I kind of assumed that there was, but has there traditionally been a gender divide in how people vote? So this is an interesting one, because there's sort of two questions here. One is, has there been a gender divide at all? And then the second is, how about in different age groups? So if we look far enough back, if we go back several decades to like the 1950s, 60s, 70s, it actually used to be the case that women tended to vote more conservatively than men. Huh. But that was true particularly of older women, whereas even at, even at those times, the gap was smaller among young age groups. So what's happened since then is, is that essentially two things have changed. Really, One is that that overall gap of women being more conservative has closed, but among younger women, it's now opened up in the opposite direction. Let's talk about the shift in a broad context before we get into some of the details. Describe what we've seen over the last, what, close to a decade now, I guess? Yeah. So we're basically talking here about a period between around 2015 and the present day. And we're talking specifically also about people aged under 30. So you could call that Gen Z. There's, there's a few younger millennials in there as well, but broadly young adults. And up until around a decade ago, to the extent that there was any kind of political gap between young men and young women, it was very small. So 
young women were maybe a couple points more liberal and more progressive than young men. We're talking here about most countries across the world. So US, Canada, UK, but also Europe and, and parts of Asia. But then in that 10 years since then, so whether we start the clock at, say, 2015, 2017, something like that, we've suddenly seen this gap opening up. And that's been, depending on the country, we either see young women becoming significantly more liberal and progressive, or young men becoming slightly more conservative, or a combination of the two. Can you give us some examples of what that looks like and where? Like, how pronounced is this? um, And where is it the most pronounced? Sure. So, I mean, if we start in Canada, for example, the gap in Canada has been there for a few years, but it does seem to have got wider more recently. So there's now around a 20 percentage point gap between the extent to which young women and young men consider this, um, themselves liberal. Huh. So just to explain what we mean by that, this is where you have surveys which ask people, do you consider yourself more liberal or more conservative? And If you take the share who say liberal and then subtract the share who say conservative, you get the sort of net liberalness, as it were, of people. And what we see in Canada is that young women are around 35 points more liberal than conservative, whereas young men are only around 15 points more liberal than conservative. So that's your 20-point gap in Canada, for example, whereas what we see in the US is, depending on exactly which survey you look at, maybe around a 30-point gap. Um, and, but then if we, if we go right out to somewhere like South Korea in East Asia, the gap there is more like 50 to 60 points. Wow. So it really does vary, but in some parts of the world, it's enormous. Even a 20-point gap from a statistical point of view, how big a deal is that? Now, this is an interesting question because within these populations of, of young men and women, there is obviously still a huge amount of overlap. So when we talk about that 20-point gap, for, for example, the way to think about it is that on the fringes of young men and young women is where you get this mismatch. So with a 20-point gap, there's a a minority of people whose views are going to be misaligned. If we think about it in in rough terms of, let's say, around 60% of young women lean in a more liberal direction versus only around, say, 40% of young men, that 20-point gap is where you've got some men who are conservative and, and their sort of female counterpart, as it were, is more liberal. So Certainly in most countries, this is less the case in somewhere like Korea, but most young men and women here would still have similar views, but it's, it's at the fringes that we're starting to see this, this sort of gap in, in politics or ideology start to emerge. You mentioned around 2015, we begin to see this shift take place. Is there anything about that period of time? Um, obviously, things move really fast uh, in modern times, but but what might have happened or what can we look at that could have been contributing to this? Yeah, so there are so many theories for what's going on here. And the tricky thing, as you say, is trying to think of something that can explain why this happened when it appears to have happened. So if we start with like the the sort of longer term shifts that we've seen, you have things, for example, like the, the expansion of higher education and the fact that young women now in, in many parts of the developed world are much more likely than young men to go to university. So where I am in the UK, for example, young women are now about 25%, almost 30% more likely than young men to go to university. And so to the extent that we think going to university can either give you new values or at least sort of awaken certain values and and ways of thinking about the world, Mm. then that certainly could explain part of why young women might be training more in this liberal direction than young men. But that is more of a long-term trend. This is something that has been gradually building up over decades. Right. So what what we need when we're looking at this sort of fairly recent divergence is to think of things that have happened more in that period of time. And there are a couple of different things that come to mind. So one is the the Me Too feminist movement. Mm -hmm. I think some people think of this as being primarily an American thing, but this, of course, had significant ripples throughout the world, from from Africa to Asia and, and of course, Europe. So so one thing that may have happened here is that in, in response to the Me Too movement, you've got essentially young women feeling more politically confident. So, So whether or not this is about people becoming more progressive, certainly feeling more confident in expressing those progressive views. That, that could explain 
part of young women's shift here. Mm. And we then have this concept in political science called negative polarization, which is where if you start to feel that you are in this sort of out group, as if it's, there's, there's a group over there and then you're in this group over here, you can sometimes start reacting and, and shifting your own views and your own politics in response to that. So it may be that among a minority of young men who felt perhaps like this very, very progressive, very vocal um, feminist movement around Me Too, maybe they felt like they were being slightly vilified or, or at least not included in that movement. They may have reacted against that and started forming more conservative beliefs of their own. So that's, that's another theory for what may have happened. And then you have other things which have been really sort of taking shape over the last decade in terms of just how we communicate with one another and where we communicate online. Huh. And what I mean by that is that before the internet, before social media really blew up, most communication between young people was either in person or, or maybe it was sort of messaging people on phones, but it tended to happen in communal spaces, whether that was at school, whether that was through various clubs that people belonged to, whether it was just uh, through local people in the community. Whereas now that we, and, and especially young people, spend significantly more time online, the types of people we encounter in those online spaces are often becoming more homogeneous, so less sort of less diverse groups. And that right. can be true of people's gender as well as everything else. So what we have today is you have these pockets of YouTube, for example, which are full of these sort of very male-focused, men-focused influencers, people like um, some of your listeners may, may have heard of Andrew Tate. Mm -hmm. And then in these other pockets of the internet, like certain bits of TikTok, you have a lot of young women spending their time watching all of these interesting clips and videos about very different things. And so that sort of divergence can allow these, this, these different views among certain young women and certain young men to really sort of solidify and take hold. So those are really interesting theories. What do we actually know about the causes of this? Is it all theory? Do we have anything in the data that could point us to uh, what is actually driving this from a numbers point of view? It's really tricky because what we're ultimately getting at here is, is these very sort of soft, almost fuzzy views most of the time. We're talking about whether people describe themselves as, as liberal or conservative. It's, it's hard often for people to, to pinpoint exactly when in their life or what in their life caused them to, to feel about themselves in that way. So in, in extreme cases, we would see this, for example, the fringe of, of some young men who clearly are being radicalized by some of these influences online, for example. But in terms of things like how social media or how the structure of the internet in general is impacting young people, it's, it's very hard to know. And, and anyone who's been influenced really in this way would struggle to know. And, and certainly when it comes to higher education and these things, I think that these are much broader phenomena that it's, it's difficult to, to pin down exactly what's going on. So it's in all likelihood, it's some combination of the above mm -hmm. and indeed probably other things that I've not mentioned here that can gradually influence how people think about themselves and their place in the world. Are there any places in the world where this isn't happening and anything we could learn from those places about what is or isn't causing this? This is where it gets interesting because some of the places where this isn't happening are places that have extreme gender inequality already. Huh. So the gap is not emerging because the existing cultural norms are so, so strong. So if we think about some parts of the Muslim world, for example, both young men and young women still hold very, very conservative views, whether you talk about politics or gender norms or any number of sociocultural issues. So, so in a lot of cases, the lack of a gap is because those societies are already so deeply conservative that any, any real difference in opinion just doesn't emerge in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then equally interesting on the opposite end of the spectrum is that in places that you would think of as being very progressive and almost libertarian and egalitarian, such as the, the Nordic countries, so the likes of Norway, Sweden, Finland and Denmark, those actually do have these gaps again hmm. with, with young women, women being more liberal and progressive than the rest. So it's, it's difficult to know exactly what a country would need for this gap not to emerge. I think that, again, we, we sort of have to go to theory here. And, and some of the best theories are that if you have a, a part of the world where 
there is a general sense of sort of progress in society. So there are relatively few reasons for young men to to feel any any sort of resentment. Mm-hmm. And and if you have a society where again the the culture is more liberal rather than clamping down on conservative opinion, then it's possible that you might get um, a smaller gap. And people sometimes talk about France, for example, as a country where women in France have long, you know, felt felt a certain confidence uh, in terms of their relations with men that has not necessarily been present in other countries. So perhaps places where this has been uh, a cultural phenomenon for longer would see less of that recent divergence. But it's, it, yeah, it's hard to know. There are, there are these sort of surprising and, and conflicting patterns in terms of where we do and don't see those gaps. Hey you, Bravo's now in Canada. I just got chills. If you know Bravo, I love that. I love that. that. You love that. You know Vanderpump Rules. Why does it have to get so complicated? Summer House. Don't activate me because you've not seen me activated. Below deck. I'm not your friend. I'm your captain. Top Chef. Hi Chef. And Housewives. <gasps> Definitely Housewives. I'm not gonna lie. I'm looking forward to this. Bravo now available. Insane. Subscribe now with your TV service provider. Fall in Canada has never been hotter. It's fascinating to try to figure out what caused it, but I'm also interested in the ramifications of this. And there's probably a few different ways uh, we can talk about it. But first, uh, let's start politically, because this is a big year uh, for elections around the world, especially in some of the countries that we're talking about right here. As you mentioned, the concept of like liberal and conservative in these responses is, is amorphous, and you don't really know exactly what people mean when they say it, but what could that mean when it's actually translated to choices on a ballot? Yeah, this is this is really interesting because in what we've seen in South Korea, we really have a sort of concrete example of this. So in the last couple of years or last few years in Korea, the party politics of that country have really mapped themselves onto this gender divide. So particularly on the male side, the more conservative party in Korea in the last election campaign, really sort of positioned itself as a party for the disillusioned and resentful young men. Hmm. And that party, which went on to win, um, propelled by a a very male-skewed vote, certainly among young people, ended up um, abolishing the Ministry for Gender Equality. So you have this sort of extreme extreme version of of a situation where a country's politics become divided by sex, by, by gender. And one party almost sees itself as primarily representing young men. The other is sort of cast as, as an opponent to that. I mean, that seems bad. Exactly. It only makes these divides even more concrete because, you know, as, as we've been talking about, whether someone views themselves as more liberal or conservative, it's, it's often quite a soft feeling. It's not right. something that you can easily make tangible. Whereas when you get to a situation where people are voting for different parties and perhaps going on different protests, it, it, even protesting against each other, that divide obviously becomes much more stark. And, and as you say, that can, if politics leans into that, it can make the whole political atmosphere in a country much more unpleasant. But of course, you know, that is a, a very extreme example. Korea is a country that has had very, very severe gender inequality for a long time. It also has a national military service, which young men are obligated to, to take part in and young women aren't. So there are all these reasons that that really looks, it's like a sort of 10x version of everything else. But yeah, even even if we're thinking about countries like Canada, the US, or, or where I am in the UK, if we get to a point where certain political parties start seeing themselves as being a party that is aimed more at men or, or at women, I certainly think that would be a very negative development. I think it's interesting, um, and I don't know how familiar you are with our government here in Canada, uh, which has been uh, liberal federally for uh, almost the past decade, almost exactly, in fact, the period that we're discussing here. Uh, and they've actively positioned themselves, and, and you know, probably rightly so, given the times that we're in, as a feminist party, uh, gender equal cabinet, all of these things that seem designed specifically, now that I think about it through this lens— to lean into uh, the support of young women that they've been relying on. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's very interesting, and, and yeah, even you know from afar, from here in the UK, Justin Trudeau's government has been yeah seen very much as as one of the most sort of explicitly and overtly progressive governments in terms of you know, the language used in particular and those kind of things. And mm-hmm. you know, it, it's a tricky one because of course you don't want to necessarily say that a government or a politician should be criticised for 
simply for holding progressive views, but I think if the language used and the the way those views are put out there, it is seen as almost uh, an element of theatre and, and perhaps too much of the sort of signalling and less focus on the outcomes of policy, then you can see how that might not necessarily help to close this gap. Leaving politics aside for a moment, what about what this means for our society in general? I mean, how is the ideological difference here showing up in real life for people under 30? Yeah, and I, I think we need to to be wary of generalizing too much here because, again, the, for most young people here, this gap is is very subtle if it exists at all. But I think on the fringes, there is a risk that we start seeing an impact, for example, on relationship formation. So whether that's marriage or or just cohabiting relationships, and of course, that can then have knock-on effects in terms of the number of people having children. If we start to see a a small but growing number of young men who have these, these very different views to a small but growing number of young women on the opposite side, then just by the law of numbers, um, the number of people who feel happy to enter into relationships is going to fall. The number of people having children is going to fall. And there has been some suggestion that that is part of what explains the, the, the very rapid decline in birth rates in South Korea, for example, mm-hmm. and, and in marriage rates. That what we're seeing there is young people, young men and women who increasingly don't see eye to eye on various issues. And then young women in particular reacting against this and saying, well, I certainly don't want to be marrying a man who holds these views. And the impact there is fewer relationships, fewer marriages and fewer children. It's an important point to say that, you know, for the vast majority of young men and women, they're closer together than these polls make them out to be. But what happens when, as I guess it so often does, the fringes that we're discussing here get the most attention? And I'm obviously not at all, suggesting that Andrew Tate and those folks represent most men, but they have an outsized presence in every major social platform when you talk about which men are elevated and which men better capitalize on the algorithm, et cetera, et cetera. So to those young women, could it not seem like the fringes are more general than they actually are and vice versa? And then, you know, the whole cycle continues. No, you're absolutely correct. And I think this is one of the the sort of um, structural issues that we've really had to wrestle with as a society since social media has come along, because we, you know, we have all these algorithms which are designed so that the most engaging content, which often means the most extreme, provocative or extreme, exactly, tends to do the best. And that means that, as you say, you can have some of these influencers who on the grand scheme of things, are not representative at all of, of, of the broad swathe of, of public opinion. But because they appeal aggressively to those on the fringes, they get amplified. And, and so I certainly think there's a risk there, both in terms of, as you say, the, the immediate impact of more susceptible people seeing that content. But as you say, there is a, equally a risk that we think that their influence is much larger than it is. And what we don't want to do here is create a situation where most young women, for example, think, oh, well, you know, all those, all those young men in, in my class or in my college or whatever are Andrew Tate fans, because that's uh-huh. certainly not the case. You know, Andrew Tate may appeal to more people than uh, any reasonable person would hope, but it is still a small minority. So, yeah, I think it's important that whenever we're talking about this, we're emphasizing that these remain fringe views, you know, they're, they're fringe views that get shouted very loudly and that make a lot of money for some people, but they're still nowhere near the mainstream. We've been talking exclusively about young people because, as you mentioned, this doesn't really show up uh, in older generations as people are over 30. Is this something that these young people might grow out of? It's a great question. And I, you know, I certainly, we, we can all hope that they will. And I'm, I'm certain, absolutely certain that many people will. But the, the tricky thing here is that there's, there's a lot of um, political science literature from decades and decades of work showing that the worldviews, the ideologies that people develop at young ages, so in their 20s, for example, do have a tendency to stick around. Hmm. And I think, I think to an extent, a lot of this will depend on whether people do end up finding relationships, whether that's friendships or romantic relationships with people of the opposite sex in general. Because, you know, as you can imagine, I think 
once someone, once a young man and a young woman are in a relationship, the likelihood of them continuing to hold these diametrically opposed views would we would certainly expect to fall. Right. So if if people can wear their politics less loudly, as it were, or wear their politics less strongly, then perhaps those initial um, initial barriers can be broken down and those views would dissipate. But if we if we see as we do at the very extremes, if we see some people making this a real, really core part of their identity, then I think it's it's certainly completely um, plausible that this could be something that lasts for many, many more years for those people. This is a phenomenon that has come on recently, as we've talked about, and uh, seems to be growing. It all sounds bad. What can we actually do about it beyond uh, telling these young people to, like, get off the internet and go touch grass and meet each other? It's a great question. And and um, my one of my answers was actually going to be to tell these young people to get off the internet and go touch grass and meet each other. So, right. yeah, I, I think that is part of it. You know, we we still forget that it's only really the last 10 to 15 years where the amount of time we spend online has really rocketed. And so I think the fact that that could be having some unforeseen consequences on people's psychology and politics is, is not surprising. And, and it may be that to an extent we need to turn back the clock slightly, spend, spend less time online. But, but as I say, I think part of this as well is about making sure that when we talk about this, we're emphasizing that this remains something that happens on the fringes. And it is possible that, you know, this does end up being seen as a phase and maybe in, a, in two, three years, people will say, oh, remember, the, remember back in those days when Andrew Tate was a thing. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's hard to know where exactly this will go. But I do think a significant part of this is going to be about trying to, to spend less time in these echo chambers. I also think maybe just on, on both sides, a little bit more empathy towards one another. I think when people throw around terms, for example, like uh, toxic masculinity or fragile masculinity, I think even though that's often well-intentioned, I don't think it's especially helpful because that can leave some of these minority of young men thinking, you know, I'm not toxic, I'm not fragile, I'm someone who has legitimate reasons to hold the views that I have. So I think if we can just show a bit more, a bit more fairness and generosity to each other, and if young men and women can do that, then that could certainly help as well. John, thank you so much for this. It's a fascinating phenomenon and a fascinating discussion. So really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. John Byrne Murdoch of the Financial Times. That was The Big Story. For more, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can listen to all our episodes there, including the episode before this one, which was about the falling fertility rate around the world. Um makes a little more sense after this conversation. If you've got feedback on any of those episodes, and uh, we got some great feedback on the fertility rate episode, keep sending it in. You can do that with an email to hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca, and you can do it by calling us up, leaving a voicemail, that number, 416-935-5935. Sometimes... I lie in bed at night, and I'm falling asleep. And this spiel that I give every day at the end of the show runs through my mind. At this point, I'm convinced it'll be one of the last things that remains in my brain. So please, don't make me waste my time. Drop us a line. Tell us what you think. If you are inside your podcast player right now, and it lets you review or rate this show. It means a lot to us when you do that. We see them. It helps other people find the show. It bumps the show up the rankings a little bit, gives us a little bit of an ego boost. So listen, none of this stuff that I say at the end of these episodes is worthless if you actually take action because of it. If you don't, then I really am out here speaking to nobody and telling that nobody Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow. Hey, you. Bravo's now in Canada. I just got chills. If you know Bravo. I love that. I love love that. that. You love that. You know. Vanderpump Rules. Why does it have to get so complicated? Summer House. Don't activate me because you've not seen me activated. Below Deck. I'm not your friend. I'm your captain. Top Chef. Hi, Chef. And Housewives. (laughs) 
Definitely Housewives. I'm not going to lie. I'm looking forward to this. Bravo. Now available. This is safe. Subscribe now with your TV service provider. Fall in Canada has never been hotter.